and welcome to the first edition of the Bucharest Security Forum, Atlantic Black Sea Security Forum to be more precise. My name is Alina Inai, I'm the director of the German Marshall Fund office here in Bucharest and together with our colleagues from the Aspen Institute Romania, we are the co-organizers of, um, of this forum and of many other fora which uh, take place here in Bucharest as well. I will very briefly like to um, explain the title, which might be, uh, the reason for the title might, might, might be obvious and the title is self-explanatory, but I think it's important to point out Two, uh, two issues when it comes to this. We have chosen the Atlantic Black Sea Security Forum title because for us here in Romania and for us here in the Black Sea region, in this region, the security of the Black Sea of the entire region, of the wider region, as you will see in one of the panels today, is extremely important. And as Romanians and as Romania, we take, we take the security uh, very seriously and we are very concerned with the developments, especially when it comes to the Black Sea. We also um, added the Atlantic word to the title because once again for this region, but especially for Romania, being a Romania, I can speak for, for, uh, for this a, li a little. Um, the transatlantic relation is more important than ever and we believe that for a sound security of the region, maintaining the transatlantic security, even enhancing it if possible in, this, in the current context, is of extreme importance. And we wanted to make sure that in the discussions today and in the papers that we'll probably release after, after the discussions today, and in, all, in our approach in general, we maintain the transatlantic, uh, transatlantic relationship at the core of our approach to, uh, to security. As I said, this is the first edition, we hope this is the first edition of this forum. Um, we want to make it a regular gathering, annual, annual gathering, because there are very many dynamic developments in the region and not only. And we think that it's important not only to take stock of the events as they, uh, as they keep unfolding, but also to, to, uh, to make sure that the discussion of the regional security is being, is being um, it, it takes place in the region as well as in, uh, in capitals, in Brussels and in uh, Washington as well. It is our pleasure to have here today, but also to have the partnership in general of the government of Romania, especially of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and of the Ministry of Defense of Romania. They have been very supportive in, being this, in putting this event together. We hope to have them close with us, uh, close to us, to, uh, to other events, uh, events as well, because it's important not only to have a room full of experts as we do today, but also to bring the officials to the panels on the stage and to hear their, uh, their point of view and their take on the, as I said, extremely dynamic, uh, dynamic situation. Without further ado, once again, I do welcome you to the, to the debates today. Hope to see you to the, to the next editions as well. And I do welcome my colleague from Esman Institute, Mircha, uh, Mircha Joana, to the stage. Thank you, Alina. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, basically, I will follow the lead of Alina, like always, uh, and our fellow uh, allies uh, from GMF in explaining why we have basically um, switched a little bit the traditional Aspen Security Forum that we organize with our dear friends from uh, NATO, from the Public Diplomacy Division of NATO, uh, under the fantastic hashtag we are NATO as a, as a formidable brand, to something that is a little bit, uh, at the same time, more narrow, but also broader. We shifted from a general conversation about security, which is, of course, a never-ending subject, to an Atlantic Black Sea accent. And we've done that on purpose because the Black Sea and the Greater Black Sea region is a microcosm of global politics. It's a microcosm of geopolitics. It's a microcosm of the competition between regional and global players. And this is why 
we decided to zoom in on the Black Sea more, but also zoom out from the greater Black Sea region to the broader conversation that the NATO summit in a few weeks' time, Mr. Apaturai is here just to, 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 to give us a message, but I hope to take back to Brussels, to the NATO headquarters, the message from our conference. Why Atlantic Black Sea? Because here in Romania, we are vitally interested in the cohesion, endurance, and efficiency of our NATO alliance. There is nothing more worrisome to countries like Romania, and I think many countries in the Euro-Atlantic space, than to see the risk of more fragility in our alliance, to see the politics in Europe and North America eroding, not in a decisive way, but in a worrisome way, the cohesion, which is the underlying bedrock of our alliance, trust, mutual interest, perception of risk and opportunity, things that are today magnified by the ample technological revolution, by the realignment of global players, and by a shift of power, including economic power in the world. This is why keeping the transatlantic tie, trying to look to the greater Black Sea region, trying to make another statement, another commitment to our transatlantic connections is the main reason for, for our conference today. Something that I would like to mention, speaking of our partners, Alina alluded to this, uh, this conference would have not been possible without the direct support uh, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Mr. Meleshkanu and his wonderful team from the Foreign Ministry, like always have been with us. The Ministry of Defense, uh, Mr. Fifor, who um, uh, is here with us, even if uh, he will be represented this morning, has a personal, uh, personal medical problem this morning, will be heading to the NATO Defense Ministerial in a few days' time when most of the uh, NATO summit um, in the substance will be negotiated. It will be not an easy defense ministerial in a few days. And, and, and Judy Dempsey, who is with us today, uh, will probably tell us more uh, over, over our conversation. Also, as a first, uh, uh, the Domestic Intelligence Service, as I arrived from Romania, is our partner today. Uh, and as a novelty, if you want, we wanted our conversation uh, for a few hours here in Bucharest to also add something more substantive to our decision makers that are about to meet in the NATO or other formats uh, in the next few weeks. The first study that we are submitting to your attention today, which has a direct reference to the, uh, to the Black Sea region, is a recent study which was conducted as a sort of a war game exercise by the U.S. Navy War College. And Steve Flanagan, our dear friend and member of two White House administrations in his career now with RAND, was part of that exercise. And here, I think also General Chuka and our people in uniform there are some interesting concepts, and Mr. Dudu Ionescu from the President's Office, uh, and Radu Tudor and the professionals in this field, this concept of porcupine defense, the idea that we have to go a little bit beyond the traditional thinking and military planning is something that I think is worth your attention. And I think this, uh, the fact that in, into the strategic thinking for the future for the U.S. Navy, you have the Black Sea and the European defense so intimately connected really shows that this is something very, very important. There is absolutely no coincidence that the annexation of Crimea by Russia was followed by a massive re-engagement of Russia in the Middle East. The Black Sea is not just the Black Sea, a relatively small and relatively narrow maritime pathway. It's a springboard 
to the Middle East, it's a springboard to Southern Caucasus, it's a springboard to Europe, it's a springboard to the Balkans, is the place. As our friends in the Baltic Sea are not just about the Baltic Sea, which is a tiny piece in the end. It's a springboard for the North, it's a springboard for the Arctic, it's something which is far more complex than that. So this is one piece of, of, a, of a contribution that we are submitting to your attention and hopefully this will make its headway into the far more complex and, and complicated uh, uh, decision-making process inside uh, the Alliance. There is also something interesting that uh, our partners from, uh, from uh, the Domestic Intelligence Service, and this is also in, in the, uh, on our site, you can find the links to this thing, they had, as, uh, SRI, as we call it in Romania, SRI, the, the reading the acronym in English, they've done, conducted an interesting Black Sea uh, forum uh, with the Harvard uh, Kennedy uh, School of Government. Just a few days ago, I think, Mihai. And they introduced something into the paper. You have it here. We have the, the, the approval to use, to reuse that document. Into the document about the Black Sea, there is a very interesting fragility index. And I think this is the other side of the coin of the resilience discussion that we have also inside the Alliance. So this fragility index shows that in the Black Sea region, uh, we are basically facing not only traditional threats, but also various degrees of different strategic, democratic, institutional, uh, or societal uh, challenges. This is basically what we wanted to, to, to do today. Um, and the last thing, which is probably for us as Aspen and GMF, probably as important as the big display of personalities and intellect that will be uh, on this stage, is the fact that we are continuing in an even more uh, aggressive way to engage our young leaders, both from Aspen and GMF. We had yesterday a wonderful conversation, and uh, uh, Bruno Lete uh, is here with us, Ambassador Costa is here with us, with our young strategists. We are encouraged by the depth and the sophistication uh, of their views on, on security, and we hope to have your contribution, our dear friends and Aspen Fellows and GMF Fellows and alumni to the Bucharest Forum that will try to put some of your contributions back on stage. I'm talking already too much. Um, this conference uh, is benefiting from the immense political and professional experience of our foreign minister, Mr. Meleshka. I will never cease in mentioning not only uh, the role he played in my life and my career, and this is something I'll always be obliged to, to Mr. Meleshkano, but also to say how much Romania needs his wisdom his immense experience, uh, his way of engaging people, and how privileged we are to invite him to address uh, our Black Sea Atlantic Security Forum, uh, continuing to believe that our diplomatic corps will continue to be in the forefront of the Romanian national interest in many, many years to come. Welcome, Minister Meleshkano, to our conference. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. And I want to underline the importance of this meeting organized by the Aspen Institute from Romania, from Bucharest, uh, the German Marshall Fund, and U.S. NATO, sorry, NATO public diplomacy uh, division. You have a very bad light here. The Black Sea region, is, it entails, it's in the context which entails the relevance for the European and Euro-Atlantic security. Discussing the situation in this realm at this moment is not only important for our community, but also very timely as we draw closer to the decision that awaits us at the NATO summit in Brussels. 
I highly appreciate the recent focus of the academic and research communities, the NGOs as well, the civil society and the mass media in Romania, as well of the continuous preoccupations of NATO with the security con in the security context of our region. The situation definitely justifies both the focus and the preoccupation. The Black Sea region, it's a meeting point throughout history. The Black Sea defines a region where cultures mingled and melted to form some of the most enduring civilizations. Since ever, life here was not always pacific, but if there is an overreaching tale speaking of, to the history of this region, it is one about conflicts and violence, but that's not the main feature, because it's also a f fracture sometimes between incompatible civilization as it happens in many regions. The black region is thus historically a major juncture at one of the Europe's ends. It is where the east touches the west and where the north grasps, grasps with the south. This region was, and it is supposed to be about continuous cooperation and interconnecting standing at the gate of the Central Europe and massive crossroads that concurrently spread towards the Balkans, the South Caucasus, the Middle East, and the eastern part of the Mediterranean. After years of sliding to the edge of Europe's uh, consciousness, over the last decade, this region has regained its vocation, becoming the next frontier to European strategic thinking in terms of energy security, trade links, and other key policy areas. However, as uh, the geostrategic importance of the area grew, interest started to clash, generating an erratic and rattle burden to the balance of power in the Black Sea region. Zero-sum logics fuel nows, prejudicial butterfly effects, and black swan as well, as illiberal and sharp power stances to the detriment of the overall progress and the regional rapprochement. In 2008, the use of force in Georgia seriously affected security in the Black Sea region. What's the stance today, 10 years later? The resolution of the crisis triggered by Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea and its subsequently heavy militarization is still nowhere in sight and this is to be taken into account. From Crimea and Eastern Ukraine, there is a build-up of logistical capabilities in support of distant naval operations and infrastructure that enable the increasing tech use of the Black Sea as a platform for the projection of military power in other regions of the globe. The third one, protect, protracted conflicts in Georgia and in the Republic of Moldova, as well as continuous and preserved skirmish between Armenia and Azerbaijan, stem anxiousness. The gray zones that potentially could or are already fueling organized crime, smuggling, and radicalization. Evidence is piling out about the increased malign activities which aim to erode democratic institutions by exploiting the features of open economies and societies. Due to the crossroad design of the region, the resilience of the institutions of most states in the Western Balkans is also severely tested with the aim of maintaining instability in the region. As the Black Sea is a key transit corridor for energy resources, the interdependence of gas imports is being used in order to generate wide and complex 
political implications. Having discovered the advantage of a presence in the area, the Chinese solid interest for energy and infrastructure investments completes the picture of a volatile Black Sea region. It is therefore difficult to escape the logic of uncertainty and troublesome developments as negative evolutions continue to have a fundamental impact on the security landscape of the entire European continent. NATO, EU, regional and trans-regional organizations are interconnected. Threats and risks spill from one realm into another with a very great speed. The Jure does not resemble de facto anymore. There is such a high degree of deliberate misperceptions and doubt about facts that the swirls we experience might indeed be caused by a storm, as you call it, a design able to consume us all little by little, replacing systems based on truth and law with complete void and democratic unresponsiveness. Distinguished uh, auditors, if indeed a storm has started in our area, united action is the only possibility to answer. We not only strongly welcome, but also actively contribute to NATO's response to this situation. It is a proportionate, legitimate answer to the troublesome evolutions. The allied threefold approach decided upon in Wales and reconfirmed in Warsaw, a strong deterrence and defense on the eastern flank, suspension of the practical cooperation with Russia and increased support for the European partners is very well grounded in the strategy reality and therefore should be maintained. We have made good progress on all tracks and the progress achieved shows that united action is not only possible, but it is also very efficient. That's why I will say that unity of allies remains the key. We are confident that the upcoming NATO summit in July will reconfirm the unity and the determination of all allies to respond efficiently to all threats and challenges, including in the Black Sea region. On the deterrence and defense, defense dimensions, we need to increase coherence of our posture and ensure that everything that was put in place starting with 2014 functions well as integral part of NATO's overall posture. We should also continue to strengthen the strategic relation with the partners in the Black Sea that share our values and principles and the respect for the international law. We need to work with them in order to enhance their own capabilities and ensure their full awareness. We should invest in the state and societal resilience of our partners at all levels, while investing in our own state and societal resilience. The focus should be on strong, democratic and efficient institutions, solid economic fundamentals, well-informed and adaptive entrepreneur and communities capable to react promptly to negative developments as well as educated and active citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, let me be clear. Romania remains faithfully a design following the cooperation and the history of the Black Sea region. We would like nothing better than seeing the security situation in this area, which creates necessary premises for developing regional cooperation and fulfilling the true economic potential of the region. Regional rapprochement must count on the ability and the political will of the Black Sea region governments to define and defense their shared economic, social, and security interests in constructive interaction 
with broader strategic partners, priorities, and power projections. Such a construct requires, however, a solid foundation consisting of respecting one's commitments and the international law in general. Any message that the gravity of using force with a view to changing borders can be in time overlooked would be extremely dangerous. Romania, as a reliable ally and a faithful Atlanticist EU, EU member, will continue to be active in strengthening European and Euro-Atlantic security in the Black Sea. We will continue to contribute to the implementation of the forward presence on the eastern flank to provide action support to our eastern partners and those of the Western Balkans to increase our national resilience against all types of threats. We will continue to do all of this as part of the united action of NATO and EU member states, or we can call it the united Western action, which was the title of your meeting today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Minister, and, uh, and good luck today. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, we do have three partners that have, have supported um, uh, tremendously in, uh, in putting this, uh, this conference together, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Defense of Romania, but also the NATO's uh, Public Diplomacy Division. And we do have here with us James Apathurai, who is a NATO's uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs and Security Policy and NATO, uh, NATO Secretary General Sp uh, Sp Special Representative to the Caucasus and Central Asia. Whew, quite a portfolio. Uh, welcome. welcome with us and come to the stage, please. Thank you, I have really long business cards. They sort of fold out. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Let me thank you for the invitation uh, to be here and thank you to all the organizers. Thank you to the Romanian government. It really is a, a pleasure to be back here. The last time I was in this building was for the, uh, the summit uh, in 2008, though I did see, I don't know if any of you know this show, uh, Top Gear, where they race uh, cars. And they had an episode where they race in the basement with Ferraris underneath this room. So that, I commend it to all of you. It's quite something to see. Um, but I was also pleased uh, to come here, not just for uh, memory's sake, but because actually I think the, um, the title is a very interesting one. When I started at NATO, which was a long time ago, uh, honestly speaking, the Black Sea was much lower on the priority list. And, and there were good reasons for that. One was, of course, the membership was different. Uh, Romania and Bulgaria were not members uh, at the time. Uh, second, because the threat environment was very different. Uh, it was not the same. Uh, it was lower uh, from a NATO point of view, and third, because uh, the member states of NATO at the time didn't necessarily see a role uh, for the alliance in a very significant way. Um, that has really changed, and it has changed very much in this way. I, I think that Atlantic, North Atlantic security has now been tied more obviously to Black Sea security. There is a greater understanding uh, of why our security, the security of this region is interdependent with the security of the wider Euro-Atlantic community. Uh, the membership, of course, has changed, and we have now two more members who are from this region. Our partnerships have changed, and actually the decisions we took in this building in 2008 uh, to put Ukraine and Georgia uh, more clearly on the membership track at their request has tied us uh, in a partnership sense uh, to the region. Uh, as well. Uh, and finally, because the security environment has deteriorated, and I'll, I'll come to that as well. So the Black Sea was a focus of the NATO summit in Warsaw in, in July uh, 2016, when Allied leaders stated, uh, Russia's recent, recent activities and policies have reduced stability and security, increased unpredictability, and changed the security environment. 
and we will take further decisions at the upcoming summit focused on this region. So this is now really part of NATO's uh, agenda, and that's very, um, that's very good. Uh, so that's the first point I would like to make, that the Black Sea region is more on NATO's agenda than it has, I think, been since the end of the Cold War. Second, uh, in part, and I listed all the reasons, but I want to expand on one of them, because we really do see the security environment deteriorating, and the minister just hinted at that. Let me just outline a few areas which he uh, touched on, but maybe I'll mention a couple in more detail. One is the Russian military buildup uh, and what we call uh, anti-access area denial, uh, which is, in essence, military talk, to describe uh, the way in which a country can deploy weapon systems, often with long-range capabilities, to deny access to other actors uh, into the region, to deny freedom of movement. Uh, and with the annexation of Crimea in particular, Russia moved a lot of high-end military equipment and continues to do so into Crimea, which, uh, which supports their anti-access area denial capacities to deny NATO and NATO allies freedom of movement in this region. And that includes land-based surface-to-air missiles, surface-to-surface -surface ballistic or cruise missiles, anti-ship missiles, as well as the platforms, aircraft, ships, and submarines, enhanced electronic warfare. All of this is sort of in layers uh, is, um, is changing the security balance in the region. And also, of course, as the minister mentioned, Russia is using Crimea and its access to this whole region to power project into uh, the Middle East. Uh, Russia is moving new kilo, kilo class subs into the Black Sea, new frigates into the Black Sea. Uh, so the security environment has changed and NATO to ensure freedom of movement and to ensure its capacity to be able to defend its allies and to be able to support its partners, we have to change too. Uh, the second point which the minister mentioned and I think it's really important and that is what we start to use, we start to use the term malign influence but what I would uh, you use another term to describe, it would be um, propaganda, disinformation, uh, funding of political parties, attempts to break uh, political unity within countries and between countries. And we see a very, very active Russian campaign across the region. Uh, and this is something that we really need to be very, very uh, alert to and something we need to respond to. Uh, it's part of what in NATO we call hybrid uh, warfare, uh, and that is looking at the spectrum below the threshold of armed conflict. Uh, hybrid does not stop at below the threshold of armed conflict, but this is an area where we need to beef up our capacities. And you will see at the NATO summit, all allies uh, focus very much on this. Um, it is also very much part of our strengthening cooperation with the European Union. So. This region is watching for it, needs to watch for it, because there is an intensified Russian campaign here. Third is the use of protracted conflicts to prevent political moves that Russia doesn't like. There are six countries in the EU's Eastern Partnership. Five of them have territorial disputes with Russia behind them. And the sixth, country is sixth one is Belarus, and if it tries to make a move towards the EU, it will also have I'm quite sure, a territorial dispute. Uh, so uh, what we see is already this pattern. It is enormously difficult for Ukraine, for Georgia, for Moldova, Azerbaijan and Armenia, Russia's arming both sides. But this also, of course, fuels organized crime, it fuels extremism and smuggling and radicalization. Uh, the minister talked about energy insecurity or security, he talked about the importance of lines of communication. I won't go into detail just to keep within a reasonable amount of time. But for all of these reasons, uh, NATO is much more focused on this, on this region than it had been in the past and for the reasons that I mentioned as well. My third point is we're doing something about it. Uh, and I wanna start by saying, even though now I've just listed all the things that Russia's doing which we consider to be a pattern of destabilizing behavior, 
we do want better relations with Russia as NATO. All NATO countries want that. I think the minister hinted that as well. And we have what we call a dual track approach. On the one hand, deterrence and defense. And on the other hand, dialogue. We've had a mildly positive NATO-Russia Council meeting just recently. We had a mildly positive meeting between the two top generals, the top NATO general, the top Russian general. So there's a little bit of glimmer of progress on that track. Uh, but the political intent by NATO to pursue a constructive military and political dialogue with Russia and seek better relations is, is very strong. But we can hope, but we have to take care of our own defense. Uh, so we are doing that, and NATO is strengthening its presence in the Black Sea region uh, in an unprecedented way, but in a way that is defensive and proportionate. Uh, and, and it's what we call uh, forward presence. Uh, let me mention a few aspects. One is the multinational brigade here in Craiova, uh, for which Romania is the framework nation. It, it forms the land component of our forward presence here. There are 10 allies committed to it, contributing to the brigade headquarters. We have enhanced training. In the air domain, two allies, one of which is my own, are reinforcing uh, the efforts of Romania and Bulgaria for air policing. In the maritime domain, uh, we have standing NATO maritime forces here with more ships, more exercises. We've established a Black Sea center uh, within the Mar NATO Maritime Command, which focuses on regional specific issues, maintains tight links with the regional navies. There's been a major exercise held here just in the last couple of weeks, and we have more training. So we are beefing up collective defense here uh, to ensure that we can defend our allies uh, when we need to. Finally, uh, we are also strengthening relations with our partners uh, in the region. Uh, we know that NATO is more secure when our neighbors are more secure. And of course, we have two countries aspiring to NATO membership, and Georgia for a very long time uh, has, um, has been getting closer uh, to NATO. So we have accelerated our, and we will accelerate at the summit, our support to them. The Ukraine, uh, well, we have a, what we call a comprehensive assistance package. There are elements of our support to Ukraine which are directly relevant to Black Sea security, for example, uh, they, their maritime academy, which was in Crimea, has now been moved and we're helping them to support that. In the case of Georgia, we have a substantial NATO-Georgia package with all sorts of elements, but we have heightened cooperation on Black Sea security. We consult much more on what's happening. We're deepening our cooperation when it comes to maritime. So we're doing what we can to work together. Uh, it's not us supporting Georgia. I have to say this is really a two-way street. Uh, to enhance uh, security in the region. And finally, when it comes to Moldova, as many of you know, we have established a defense capacity building program with them to help them with defense reform. We've set up a very small liaison office at the government's request, so we're deepening our ties in the way that they like. So we're doing our best to, to support uh, our partners in the region as well. So just one final point. Uh, this is happening. Atlantic Black Sea is happening uh, in NATO. This region is central now to the way in which we think and approach security in the Euro-Atlantic region. That's new and it's, it's very important. I would just like to take the opportunity to commend a, a Romania for its extremely active, determined pursuit of raising the profile of this region in NATO, of ensuring that we do the right thing in this region, of helping the design of what NATO is doing and of playing a central role in it, for example, through the Framework Brigade. So Romania is walking the walk and not just talking the talk in NATO, but it talks the talk very well as well. So let me uh, just compliment uh, Romania. I think the success of moving the Black Sea more centrally to the NATO agenda is very much uh, a Romanian success. So thank you very much again for the invitation. I look forward to hearing how the con conference goes. Thank you so much. This was a truly comprehensive overview of the situation. Uh, we, I'm a little bit more optimistic after hearing uh, David about, uh, about the, the NATO summit in Brussels. Um, um, 
the, the message that the Minister FIFO, the Minister of Defense, um, has prepared for this conference, and uh, this very morning he basically was in the impossibility to, to, to join us for, again, medical reasons. Uh, Deputy Defense Minister Nikolai Nasta is here with us. Uh, we talked to him, and, uh, and uh, uh, the message of Minister V4 will be put on our website as an official contribution to, the, to our conversation. And also because we are a little bit ahead behind the schedule, I would like to, to move immediately to the next panel. Uh, uh, mentioning that uh, the third contribution to our conference uh, is produced by our knowledge partner, uh, PWC uh, Romania, uh, basically uh, on the topic of how can we use the 2% uh, of GDP for defense, not only to strengthen our military, and General Chuka is here and his colleagues, but also to strengthen our economy and making sure that this investment uh, produces, uh, you know, uh, multiplying impact in our, in our economy. Uh, the logic that we um, are proposing to the conference and to, to, our, um, to our friends in this room, and also outside of the room, because uh, uh, Ager Press, uh, RFE, and Cala European are our media partners, and this conference is streamlined and it's produced live for the ones who are not in this room. The idea is to have three quick uh, panels, uh, very intense, um, uh, intensely moderated, uh, basically on, on the first part of our title, Weathering the Storm. It is a, an exceptionally complex moment, uh, not only for the region, but also for, for our alliance and for the world. And this is why uh, we opted for this quicker version of the conversation. And in the second part, uh, we'll get into the second question is whether Western action is still possible. So this, uh, this is the logic describing the, uh, the multiple storms, but also trying to find new synergies and new rationale for us to stay together and move forward together, as uh, I think all of us in this room um, believe is the best way to move forward. So, the, this exceptional panel that is about to start now, uh, moderated by Bruno Lete, our dear friend, uh, senior fellow, uh, security defense from uh, GMF uh, uh, in Brussels, will be composed by our distinguished uh, chief of the Romanian general staff, uh, General Nicolae Ciuca, a dear friend of ours and a, an exceptional professional. We are very happy to have the general here. Stephen Flanagan, uh, who is now a senior political scientist at RAND, as I mentioned before, also a dear friend from my days in Washington. He served in two White House administrations, uh, uh, once in the NSC, secondly also in the NSC on political military affairs, the most complex issues uh, in this, not only the planet, also outer space, were with Steve's uh, uh, portfolio. So, uh, Please focus on the Black Sea, Steve. We see how things are looking from above. And of course, our uh, 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 third panelist, uh, Belul Loskan, associate professor at the Marmara University, Turkey, is a player of immense significance, uh, not only in the Black Sea, but in world affairs. And having also Turkey into this conversation is, uh, is paramount to our thing. Bruno, do you have an exceptional team? Get rolling. Yeah, okay, this is working. So, good morning, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here in Bucharest. Personal pleasure for me to be back in Bucharest. Uh, I think definitely one of the best places uh, you have in Europe to learn about and, and discuss uh, Black Sea uh, security. This is 
indeed the very team of our uh, exquisite panel this morning. Um, as said previously, it is a microcosmos of global power uh, geopolitics, and things may seem peaceful uh, at first sight, but take a deeper dive and uh, you may just uh, see a, a storm um, emerging at the horizon. Uh, Russia is on the march, uh, Georgia and Ukraine remain affected by uh, insecurity. Uh, Turkey too uh, faces uh, deeper change in its politics and remains affected by sustained uh, turmoil on its southern flank. And in the meantime, the bigger powers, EU, NATO, US, Russia, uh, do compete for political and military influence or balance uh, in, in this region. New actors emerge too, uh, think about China, who mainly seeks economic incentives uh, for now. So that is, in, in a nutshell, is what we want to talk about uh, this morning. Um, I hope that we can zoom out 10,000 feet uh, for a second and look at the trends that will define uh, the Black Sea region in the years ahead. What are the chances for peace and prosperity? What are the obstacles we need to brace for? Uh, and what can we do together uh, with both sides of the Atlantic uh, to, to build um, stability um, here and in the broader um, region? Our uh, speakers have been introduced, so I do not need to do that, but uh, I do hope to hear from each one of you gentlemen just you know, your brief takeaways uh, on this topic, and then I hope we can also turn to you uh, for thoughts and comments. We have about an hour time, so let's get this get going. Um, perhaps I would like to start with you, uh, Mr. Chuka. Uh, what are the trends that you are uh, watching closely and uh, also what role do you see for Romania to manage these trends in the years ahead? Yeah. Good morning and uh, thank you very much for the invitation and having the opportunity to uh, um, have this uh, uh, dialogue. Um, within this very uh, uh, special panel, with these very special uh, uh, people. So, uh, from the military point of view, I do really believe that all the main challenges have been already mentioned by um, all the, the speakers before and also by, by you. Um, uh, the, um, what I would like to um, to underline it's uh, the fact that uh, um, we are uh, not focusing only on the Black Sea, as Mr. Joanna has mentioned. It's not only about the Black Sea, it's also about the extended area of the Black Sea, and also it's about the potential of the um, um, uh, Black Sea uh, if we look on the history and also if we are looking on the uh, uh, reality, uh, we should consider that who is controlling the Black Sea, it's, um, uh, it can leverage to project power on the uh, mainland Europe, on the northern Africa, on the Middle East, on Caucasus, and so on and so forth. On one hand. On the other hand, if we are looking around the Black Sea, we can see that, and um, I used to say that around the Black Sea, it's a frozen conflict belt, starting from uh, um, Ossetia, Abkhazia, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, uh, Transnistria, and we also have, it's not a frozen conflict, but we also have to consider um, um, the sensitivity of the security situation in the, in the uh, Western Balkans. And also we have to uh, mention as well Ukraine, um, which is also a riparian country of the Black Sea. Um, so, um, taking into account all these issues, um, we are doing our best in order to convince everybody that it's necessary to um, take all the measures uh, from the military point of view and not only because I would like to mention a little bit about that the security is not only related to the military and there are a lot of aspects in regard of um, what we have to consider in order to create resilience and security. So, from the military point of view, we have also established a NATO infrastructure in this part of, of, uh, of the uh, alliance. 
And we are also uh, trying to convince everybody that increasing the NATO presence and increasing the NATO infrastructure in this area would not let this region to uh, become a soft belly of the alliance and the soft belly not only of, the, um, um, of NATO but also of the European Union. Because here we have to see all, uh, both organizations as going together and providing synergy for all the countries which are part of the organization in order to um, um, increase the capability and the capacity to cope with all these challenges. So, uh, um, I do really believe that uh, looking to the military, uh, we have to uh, convince all our political masters that it's not about creating new toys for, for the soldiers. It's about creating that capacity for each country to be able to defend, our, to, depend, to defend itself and also to be able to have and to play its complementary role within the alliance and within the Union, the European Union. Um, we, were, um, we were very much supported by all our um, um, uh, aligned members. We have already uh, uh, created the uh, operational capability of the already mentioned multinational brigade southeast, of the multinational division southeast. We are, we are um, uh, consolidated the realm of conducting air policing and having um, uh, UK, Canada, Italy, uh, Portugal uh, uh, conducting air policing in, 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 the, in the Black Sea region, and also having that capacity to switch from air policing to air defense uh, just in case. There, are, there is also uh, an initiative in order to increase the presence and all the um, training measures in order to um, raise the, the level of interoperability on the land domain. And not the least, within the maritime uh, uh, domain, we are uh, very much uh, um, benefiting of the SNMG2 presence in the Black Sea. And if we are looking Atlantic and Black Sea security, we have to consider that the Black Sea is linked uh, uh, to the Atlantic Ocean by the Mediterranean Sea. So we also, when we are speaking about the Black Sea security, we have also to consider what's happening in the Mediterranean Sea as well. So um, um, taking into account all these issues, um, I think we are uh, in some way <coughs> um, fortunate to have a political decision to get 2% for, from the GDP for defense budget. Um, I am not saying that it's easy. It's very hard to spend those money because um, based on uh, what Mr. Joanna mentioned, porcupine strategy, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a, con a concept which gives us the uh, possibility to reflect a little bit on what we have to do in terms of balancing uh, the development of the conventional uh, uh, capabilities and the uh, unconventional capabilities, which really should be developed, taking into account that, as I mentioned before, we have not only to look to the military, but also to consider all the other instruments of power, uh, from uh, um, <coughs> Ministry of Interior, from uh, all the other um, uh, military and the civilian intelligence services, uh, we have to look to the uh, uh, economical power, uh, uh, diplomacy, and all the other instruments of power. So all of them should be considered together and should be integrated. And here I think it's a matter of which should be taken into consideration by um, all the political leaders to create that platform able to integrate and to... Uh, um, um, be able to, to um, 
leverage all these instruments in order to cope with all these new challenges. So based on this porcupine strategy, uh, I think uh, we have already started to do something in regard of it, even it was not delivered yet, we were thinking about how we can maintain the capacity of the, and the capability of the, the unconventional, uh, the conventional uh, um, equipment and forces we are um, having in our, in our military and how we can develop all the other instruments regarding to uh, special forces, cyber, uh, unmanned uh, vehicles. Uh, are we able, ha are we having that experience to integrate all these issues and to um, make them playing their complementary role um, uh, with the um, um, conventional, conventional instruments of the military power? So that's not easy, that's a very, uh, uh, that's a very uh, complex challenge for all of us. And I think here it should be a, a common effort and a common endeavor of military, academia, um, uh, defense industry, um, think tankers, uh, all these issues should be uh, uh, considered together in order to have a, a we are seeing a full operational picture in order to have a good decision in this respect. So I will end here and then be able to answer any question. Thank you very much. Well, and thank you very much for outlining concrete measures uh, that must prevent this region, as you say, to become a soft belly uh, of Europe. Uh, you also touched briefly on the frozen conflicts. I think it is very important because they're not so frozen at all. As a matter of fact, they can heat up quite intensively by times. Uh, I hope we'll have time uh, on this panel or later today to also think a little bit how to address those. Um, but let me turn to uh, you, uh, um, Mr. Oskan, uh, and take uh, the perspective from another country in the region, Turkey. Um, Turkey is a NATO member, complex relationship with the EU, facing elections soon, very soon, looking south, for sure, to the instability of the Middle East, but looking north as well developing its own kind of relationship with Moscow. So tell us a little bit more from where you, where you are from, where you're looking at, what role to expect for Turkey uh, in a short and midterm perspective. Thank you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> as you all know, uh, Turkish foreign policy uh, towards Syria changed 180 degrees in 2016. And uh, I'm trying to explain the recent Russian-Turkish rapprochement and how it became possible uh, for Turkey to act uh, close to Russia and make two military operations. First in Euphrates Shield against ISIS and the second uh, PYD controlled area Afrin, which is considered as a terrorist organization by Turkey and concert as PKK's wing in Syria. But before going to Turkey's foreign policy in Syria, uh, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about Russian foreign policy. And I think the, the title of this uh, panel is very well selected uh, uh, about the eastern flank. Uh, not, nothing new on the eastern flank. Well, there are some continuities and some changes. Uh, and the, the mo one of the most significant continuity is Russian stance towards Black Sea and the Caucasus. Because when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, the, one of the biggest lessons for uh, Russia was uh, Baltic countries' integration into NATO and European Union. And this was considered as a threat for Russia. And therefore, uh, Russian number one strategy towards Black Sea and the Caucasus was uh, never repeat the same mistake that we made in the Black Sea. Don't let the Russian uh, neighborhood or uh, uh, the regions that are number one strategically important for Russia uh, led uh, to the Western influence. And therefore, as uh, the previous speaker analyzed, uh, there is a uh, continue to 
of Russian strategy towards Transdiester, towards Crimea, towards Donbas, Abasia, South Ossetia, and Nagorno-Karabakh. And Russia used these ethnic conflicts and uh, the clashes for its own interests and made Russia, for all partners, or for all uh, actors in, in these regions, uh, as a burdensome necessity. Uh, for example, let me uh, use the Nagorno-Karabakh example. Uh, there are Russian forces in Armenia. Uh, Russia protects Armenian airspace. But at, at the same time, there are close Russian uh, Azerbaijan relations. On the one hand, Russia is using Nagorno-Karabakh conflict to make Armenia completely dependent on Moscow, but at the same time, uh, increasing other reven uh, oil revenues, uh, and there, there are increasing military uh, expenditures of Azerbaijan. 85% of other military ex expenditures uh, are going to Russia. And therefore, Russia is making sure that Azerbaijan is also continue to depend on, on Russia. Therefore, it is using Nagorno-Karabakh conflict for its own conflict, uh, for its own interest. Uh, well, th we see the same uh, strategy in Syria, and I'm going to explain it uh, in details and how Turkey uh, became part of that strategy. Uh, well, uh, if you, uh, look at uh, Syria, uh, the Russian involvement in Syria goes all the way back to 1950s, 1960s. Let me give you an example. One of the most important uh, dam, uh, hydroelectric dam, Tapka Dam, was uh, constructed by Soviet Union in 1960s. And that Tapka Dam, as a result of this construction, a significant Arab population was uh, forced to migrate from that construction area, and Soviet strategy was to force them to move to the, uh, to the north. Uh, basically, Soviet told the Syrians, uh, Damascus administration, uh, use this Arab population and uh, make them uh, to settle in the north between the two Kurdish areas so that you are going, you may in the future use this divide and rule strategy. And uh, this Soviet lesson was very well taken uh, by Damascus and uh, still uh, Assad uh, is, uh, the Damascus Syrian government is using this Arab population in, in order to influence uh, this region. But I am trying to say that the Russian influence, Russian interest in, the, uh, in Syria did not start in 1990s or in, in after the Arab uprising, but it goes all the way back, back to 1950s and 60s. Therefore, Soviets and Russians, its legacy, uh, they uh, know even the demographics of Syria very well. Uh, however, uh, Syrian, uh, Russian strategy towards Black Sea, towards uh, Caucasus, and towards Syria is not expansionist, uh, I think. Uh, it's it's a, a more a defensive strategy. Uh, and in, in Syria, for, for Kremlin, it's a, a national, national security threat, first of all. Syria is considered, the uprising in Syria and armed conflict in Syria is considered as a national security threat for Russia. For Russia. Uh, because there are thousands of fundamentalist jihadis fighting in, uh, in Syria, and uh, Moscow is considering that if it is not going to fight against them in Syria. In the near future, it's going to fight against them in Dagestan, in Chechnya, in Moscow, in Peter, St. Petersburg. Therefore, it's, it's objective is let's fight them in Syria and don't let them to come to Caucasus or to Russia. And however, in 2015, in September, uh, especially uh, after the summer, uh, there was a retreat of Syrian army, and everybody was talking uh, about the collapse of Syrian army uh, against the, the opposition. And at that time, uh, in September 2015, Putin made a significant decision and decided to intervene militarily in, in Syria. And uh, when Putin made its speech in, in the United Nations, it, he emphasized two important points. For Russia, 
there are two legitimate actors in Syria. Number one, Syrian army. Number two, he called Kurdish militias. Uh, and uh, all other uh, armed groups are considered uh, as terrorist groups uh, by Russia. And therefore, Putin is very well aware of the fact that uh, in the near future, uh, the uh, Syrian government cannot uh, rule Syria in, in a unified way. And it is very difficult for Syrian administration to govern the Kurdish held territories. And therefore, its strategy was very similar to Caucasus. I call it Caucasization of Syria, Caucasization of Syria. Uh, using the armed conflict for its interest, using divide and rule strategy, helping two actors, and on the other hand, uh, making Russian military and political presence in the country as a burdensome necessity. And at that point, one of an important change happened, and th there was a close cooperation between PYD and American administration uh, against the fight uh, uh, against ISIS. And that was considered as a threat for Russia. Because Russia, on the one hand, Russia considers PYD as a legitimate actor in Syria, or Kurdish uh, militias as a legitimate actor on the Syria. On the other hand, it considers increasing American influence as a threat of its own uh, interests. Therefore, by letting Turkey and by making a deal with Turkey uh, and letting Turkey in to the Euphrates shield, it increased Turkey's influence in Syria and it increased uh, Turkey's threat or Turkey's uh, influence towards the Kurdish held uh, region in the northeast of Syria. On the other hand, it made Turkey dependent on Russia as a uh, burdensome necessity. And uh, therefore, uh, using the same strategy that it used in the 1990s and in the uh, first decade of uh, 21st century, it uh, made political actors in Syria to dependent on, on Russia. Uh, let me talk a little bit about on Turkish strategy. As I mentioned, after 2016, Turkey's foreign policy towards Syria changed 180 degrees. And when the Arab uprisings, two more minutes? Okay. Uh, when the Arab uprisings started in 2011, Ankara's strategy was uh, from Tunisia to Syria, the authoritarian regimes are in the rule are going to collapse. And in, in their place, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood parties are going to come to power. This was uh, Ankara's strategy. Uh, and Turkey is going to be the leader of this Ihwan belt, Muslim Brotherhood belt from Tunisia to Syria. That was the strategy. However, in five years, Turkey realized that uh, this was beyond its expectations. I mean, it, it, it was beyond uh, Turkey's capacity and the Islamic party's capacity to govern this region. And uh, therefore, in 2016, it uh, made a change. And as a result of 3.5 million Syrian refugees in Turkey, uh, the terrorist attacks in uh, Turkish uh, cities, Istanbul and Ankara, Syria became uh, a national security threat for Turkish uh, decision makers. And they decided to make a rapprochement with Russia. However, uh, I don't call this recent rapprochement with Tur between Turkey and Russia, I don't call it as an alliance. It was a necessity. Uh, maybe I will uh, analyze it in more details with the questions. All right, thank you very much. And my apologies to cut you short, but we only have an hour and uh, I wanna make sure that we all can contribute. But I do appreciate how you underline the interconnectivity, I would say, between security interests in one part of the world and the other part of the world. Whatever happens there affects us here as well. Uh, that's very clear. Um, last but not least, Steve Flanagan, I have one simple question for you. It's actually the title of this event. Is United Western action possible? I mean, at times that both sides of the Atlantic are evaluating their future together. How does that play out here in the Black Sea? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I think that uh, I, I think that is is this is this on? Oh, thank you. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you, Bruno. 
Uh, yes, no, I, wanna, I do want to uh, focus on that because I think some of our earlier speakers have touched on uh, much of the context in the security environment, uh, much of which I agree with. Um, but uh, so I guess I, I want to offer a measured yes. I do think there's more consensus and continuity. I wanted to pick up on that theme of um, really the question that's posed to us. Is there nothing new, but also what about a continuity and change within both Russian strategy and policy, but also in, in NATO and U.S. strategy and policy? But, but first let me just say, first of all, thank you to Mircea Joana for that very gracious introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be back uh, in Bucharest after, after a somewhat long hiatus, and I remember very fondly my, my very first visit here 21 years ago, my colleague Mark Grossman and other members of our delegation that negotiated the strategic partnership with Romania, which celebrated its 20th anniversary this time last year, uh, with uh, the notion of, of deepening our engagement with Romania um, on a broad range of, of uh, bilateral and transatlantic issues. And, and wider global issues that, that uh, Mercha touched on. And, and when you look at the success of that partnership over the last 20 years, uh, I think it's very heartening. It certainly exceeded, I think, the expectations that, that many in Washington had at the time, and, uh, and certainly uh, many in Washington, to answer somewhat, Bruno, your question, I do think that uh, the commitment of Romania and other allies and partners in the region, the, the nature of uh, the continuing engagement, both in the recent last two administrations, the current administration, with the region, the commitment to uh, maintaining uh, security cooperation, but the whole range of cooperation on, on global and transnational issues, on other aspects of political and security cooperation remains. Um, and we have, uh, you know, I think many great uh, achievements to tout in that process. But I do think also, and, and Mircea very aptly pointed out at the beginning, uh, one of the rationales that was, uh, that I think figured prominently in the U.S. decision-making process back in the 1990s and early 2000s as to why Southeastern Europe should be part of NATO was this recognition that Mercha pointed to, that, that it is very much a, a, a pivotal region. Uh, obviously, we already had Turkey and Greece within the alliance, but this recognition that, uh, particularly from just the U.S. perspective, that Southeastern Europe was, a, was a, an opening of a, 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 a springboard, as Mercha put it, uh, to this broader region uh, in the Middle East, in Southwest Asia, and into uh, even into the to the uh, uh, the broader um, uh, the Southwest Asia region. So that recognition uh, has borne fruit, and that uh, the, the the ability to have these partnerships, the cooperation that we have, uh, uh, you know, both with uh, Romania and Bulgaria in terms of access or military access arrangements, other kinds of military to military cooperation, have all been have all been part of that and realized. So as I said. Uh, uh, Bruno asked me to, I, I'm, I was going to talk about continuity and change, uh, but in the interest of time, I, 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 won't, uh, I won't spend too much time on the, on, the, on the continuity, but rather talk about some of the change and also some of the discussion that we had at a very interesting workshop uh, up at the Naval War College in March about uh, what might be the elements of a sustainable, um, uh, at least from uh, that discussion was mostly limited to the United States, but very much focused on uh, and there were a few allies present in that discussion, but also what could be sustained uh, and a credible um, and, and a whole of government approach in, in looking at enhancing security and stability in southeastern Europe and across uh, in the wider Black Sea region uh, onto the eastern shore of the, of the Black Sea. Um, so I think we, we all, there's no reason to repeat the, uh, in terms of continuity, we, we uh, I think have heard from a number of our speakers and, and certainly many in the audience know well the enduring elements of, of Russia's strategy of trying to uh, seek to uh, divide the alliance to cause fissures. Uh, President, President Orjan, you know talked about Russia's efforts, but I, I think somewhat unsuccessful to try to push Turkey a bit away from the alliance um, uh, and, and to disrupt cohesion to control energy flows. Um, but I think some of the more alarming things that we've seen and the changes in Russian strategy that, that sort of underpin some of the, these recommendations that uh, for a way forward that uh, we discussed up in Newport early this year and, and which have already been mentioned here, is that, of course, Russia is more actively trying to undermine the broader international and European security order uh, through its disinformation Kim James Apatori uh, alluded to these, the interference in elections, the uh, internal uh, political engagement, uh, and using social media and new technologies to cause this uh, sense of a growing social and, and political tensions within, within the Western uh, group of states. Um, Obviously, the military buildup in the Crimea, I think James and others have done a good job of already touching on the implications of that. 
uh, and how uh, the, the balance really has shifted uh, in terms of the growth of the so-called A2AD uh, threat. It's not, it's not impermeable. It's not, it doesn't mean that there aren't countermeasures, but, uh, but it does create a new dynamic as we look at both uh, the maritime and the air presence in the region uh, and what that means, for, excuse me, for NATO operations going forward. Um, but I do think that, uh, and here I, I might uh, agree, uh, disagree a little bit with Professor, um, uh, 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 Professor Oskan about, uh, about the, the nature of, of what the Russian presence is. I do think it, it is a largely defensive and protective strategy. Uh, but when you look at the, the magnitude of the buildup of the forces in the southern military district, of the changes in the military capabilities that uh, have been wrought by the buildup uh, on the Crimean Peninsula, uh, the other changes um, in uh, aspects of uh, uh, cruise missile developments, the, the uh, in investments that are being made in the Black Sea Fleet, this is leading to a more robust uh, and power projection kind of capability that whether it will be used, but I, and I point to you, I commend to you, I was in Stockholm earlier this year uh, talking to some of our colleagues at the Swedish National Defense Research Institute, FOI, and they've just done a very interesting uh, paper on the Caucasus where they uh, their conclusion is is that the uh, when you look at all of that posture, um, that uh, that posture is is not really sustain uh, justifiable, or, or I guess it can't be uh, justified on the basis of simply dealing with maintaining regional hegemony and dealing with local conflicts. That it does seem to be designed for potential large scale conflict in the southern war theater, uh, including uh, power projection into the broader Middle East. So I do think, and I think General Cook alluded to this, we do need to to look at this. Uh, in that broader context, and how does that relate to overall NATO planning and, and of course, some aspects of separate U.S. Uh, uh, defense planning and strategy. Um, and, and also, uh, Mircea mentioned in space, uh, I mean, I do think we see uh, one of the other changes that's important in Russian strategy is their plans to disrupt uh, uh, NATO command and control through, through various measures, including cyber and counter space activities. Uh, to uh, disrupt uh, the ability to respond to potential aggression in the future uh, and to disrupt NATO reinforcement plans. And all of this needs to be, um, to be dealt with as we, as we look at efforts to maintain the, the credibility and commitment of, of uh, Article 5 uh, guarantees. So um, what, are, what are the key elements of NATO strategy, of course, and where, where do I see a lot of continuity? Well, I think clearly uh, there have been efforts, as I said, across the last three administrations, uh, really since 2014, to not only assure allies that Article 5 guarantees will be fulfilled, uh, but now uh, with this expansion of the European Defense Initiative, the funding for that, almost almost uh, doubling the funding in the current fiscal 19 request, the deployment of, the, uh, of the, all of the deployments that we've seen of the EFP battalions, the tailored forward presence in Southeast Europe that was already discussed, <laughs> Uh, maintaining this continuous rotation of U.S. forces to train and exercise with allies and other partners in the regions, and, and, and I emphasize on both sides of the Black Sea region, we were discussing with some of our Georgia colleagues the very robust program that the U.S. Army and others have uh, with uh, training and, and exercises uh, in Georgia. Um, expanding of the uh, naval presence of the forward, uh, what's called the forward deployed naval presence in, in Europe. Uh, and how that has uh, been another sign of continuity and commitment in the U.S. Uh, uh, presence. Now, what are, what are then some of the questions of the, the road ahead? What, what's a sustainable program? And, and, uh, and, and this I just want to touch on briefly some of the discussions that we had uh, in, uh, um, uh, in, in Newport. Um, that, uh, first of all, that, that, uh, that we, do need to, to, we do need to look at at uh, how this can be dealt with in an integrated way, that there is uh, this, um, well, many of these uh, elements of, of, uh, of the challenge that we confront in the security domain, and it has already been alluded to, this need for a whole of government approach, uh, that we do need to, to look at the full spectrum of threats. So James Apathuri, you know, touched on this on the hybrid threat and then what we oftentimes at RAND are called uh, measures short of war, these efforts to, to cause disruption to prepare opportunities for uh, perhaps using military force or other kinds of coercion in a crisis. How do we, how do we harden society, strengthen resilience, you know, in, in a full spectrum way. But 
Um, so just to tick off very quickly, and, and the, 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 the title of this workshop in, in Newport was Breaking the Mold. So we were, we were looking a, a little bit, uh, as we like to say in the US, out of the box ideas. But, but these are just some of them, and I'll throw out. And these are with no, no specific priority. But, uh, and, and the uh, Aspen Institute has put the report from that workshop on uh, its website. But the sense is we should probably look at restructuring the European Deterrence Initiative a bit away from traditional force and power projection packages towards more cost-imposing strategies. That is to say, uh, on the high end, invest in enhancements in electronic warfare, suppression of, of uh, air defenses uh, with uh, air-to-surface cruise missiles, air defense systems that, uh, that project an A2AD capability on the western side and extending across uh, areas of the Black Sea. Um, to counter the Russian power projection and potential capabilities that are there. On the lower end of the conflict spectrum, we talked about uh, improving expanded deployment of anti-tank weapons, of using more effectively special operations forces or paramilitary forces, as well as uh, improving uh, civilian resistance and enhanced capacities for total defense, as it's called in, in some parts of Europe. Uh, but these improvements in resilience in civilian preparations to deal with, uh, with potential lower level threats that could defeat any kind of destabilization efforts or interference. We looked at expanding the naval, uh, the, uh, the forward naval presence in Europe and to tailor the traditional rotational presence of the US Navy uh, to be a bit more focused on specific uh, sub-regions of Europe so that to include to southeastern Europe. Uh, General Cooker alluded to the, uh, we talked a lot about the, uh, the potential capacity of, of unarmed, uh, you know, un unmanned vehicles, both unarmed, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, but also underwater vehicles, other kinds of capabilities and new technologies that can be important force multipliers in disrupting any kind of uh, effort to, uh, to project power and to create a, uh, in this theme of this porcupine defense that uh, Richard Joanna alluded to. Um, enhancing cyber defense capabilities and linking them with uh, a more integrated counter messaging and, and to counter the effectiveness of Russian strategic communications and efforts to disinformation campaigns to experiment with a more dynamic rotational presence of ground forces to, to make it less predictable a bit, uh, to not necessarily have the same locations all the time being used, but to look at uh, how we could uh, create a bit of uh, a bit more of a uh, show the adaptability and flexibility of that posture to deal with contingencies wherever they might arise uh, in in Central and Eastern Europe uh, and to look, continue to advance the prepositioning of stocks and supplies and equipment to make sure that that rotational presence or augmentation of that could take place quickly uh, and lastly um, I think there was a lot of discussion about this whole question well should we look at enhancing a, a, a larger permanent presence or basing uh, and some of you may have seen General uh, Hodges, the former U.S. Army commander uh, here in Europe, uh, just had a, an interesting article in Politico that was posted earlier this week arguing against the idea of the Polish proposal of establishing a large permanent base in Poland uh, for a number of reasons. And indeed, I think there was a lot of discussion about what the, and, and questioning about the benefits of that versus a maintaining and, and building up a more robust rotational presence uh, with this act of uh, prepositioning of equipment and stocks. We can talk about a little bit of that in, uh, perhaps in the discussion. So let me stop there and uh, I'll look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for setting the scene. I think your remarks uh, gave a very adequate tour de table, uh, like we say. Um, we have uh, about 10 minutes left, so that's really not much. And um, being at the German Marshall Fund, we take the Punktlichkeit very seriously. So we will try to uh, end on time. But I see there are many hands, but I will take only two. Uh, I have the gentleman there, and I have the gentleman in the back with the blue suit and the glasses. Yes, you, with the finger. There and there. I, there's one coming there, I see. Please introduce yourself, and yeah. no comments, no comments, just a okay. question. <laughs> okay, then I have many comments, but I will just a question. Muzaffer Shanel from Istanbul Sheikh University, Director for Center for Modern Turkish Studies. Two questions. One is for Behlu, that the rapprochement is sustainable. How do you elaborate with this process? I have lots of questions anyway. That the Stefan, that my question is about that the, the US is, uh, some argues that the US is undermining the, the Turkish national security by supporting the, the PYD in, in Syria. 
and how do you elaborate this support to PYD, which will that the Turkish NATO, uh, let's say, to NATO, NATO relations in regards to the US-Turkish relations as well, which has a negative impact on the Black Sea as well. Thanks. Thank you so much. And the second question, uh, yes, you, sir. Yes. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, good morning. Uh, Levin Strauss, Strauss uh, Group. Uh, for, uh, for the Turkey, how much deeper you go Euphrates shield uh, in the northern Syria operations? On your, on your opinion? And uh, for Mr. Chuk, another question. Uh, the future cooperation between Romania and Turkey for the security of the, the Black Sea uh, for, let's say, about two years from now on. Thank you both for uh, these questions. So let me perhaps uh, get back to the panel uh, to address that. And perhaps let me also add an overarching uh, framework to these, uh, to these comments. From your perspective, when we look at uh, the Black Sea, how do we, or how will we achieve balance and stability in this region? What must be done in order um, to achieve that result? So if you could each perhaps take this into account and also answer the questions, uh, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Mr. Chuka. <clears throat> very shortly and very simply, I do really believe in increasing the national capability for defense uh, our countries. So each country from the Black Sea neighborhood, the NATO countries, uh, uh, the, in, which are uh, in the Black Sea neighborhood should increase their capacity to defend themselves and then to um, play their role within the alliance in order to answer to that uh, um, decision of um, increasing the uh, uh, deterrence and defense posture of the alliance. Thank you very much. Short and clear. There, there is, there, sorry, there is a very clear defense capability assumed by each country which should be uh, achieved according to the uh, commitment of each nation. Uh, for the first question, uh, sustainability of Turkish-Russian relations, well, that's very difficult to uh, predict because, as you might remember, uh, in 2015 November, uh, Turkey shut down the Russian war plane, uh, which became the first NATO country after the Korean War who shut down on the Russian war plane. And then, one year later, Russian ambassador in Ankara, in the center of Ankara, was assassinated by Turkish policemen. And therefore, I mean, and then at the same time, Turkish-Russian rapprochement was uh, going on. It's a very oxymoronic relationship, the Turkish-Russian relationship. I mean, it's very difficult to predict. And both countries has uh, interest in, in economic areas, but there are also conflicting interests in, in Syria, in the Black Sea. And uh, therefore, it is uh, very difficult to, to predict. Uh, however, uh, I should add that uh, there are lots of discussions about S-400 missiles, Turkey leaving NATO, speculations. And I don't think the, uh, these uh, speculations, uh, uh, I don't think these are serious because it is also against uh, Russian interest, Turkey leaving NATO. I mean, don't forget that Russia is selling $30 billion natural gas to Turkey. And uh, for uh, Putin, the, one of the most important uh, issue is uh, to be paid by Turkey uh, annually $30 billion. And uh, it doesn't want Turkey leaving NATO and instability in Turkish economy, crisis in Turkish economy. It, 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 it's the number one priority is getting $30 billion check for na Turkish, uh, Russian natural gas annually. And uh, I couldn't understand the second question about Euphrates Shield. Uh, Uh, how long? I mean, how... Well, it, it, 
it all depends on uh, again on Russia because Turkish military operation uh, is supported by Turkish warplanes and it needs uh, as uh, Syrian airspace is uh, controlled by Russia uh, it needs a green light for each operation and for the, con for the sustainability of Turkish military presence in north of Syria and therefore as I said in my speech uh, it's, it's a big asset for uh, Russia because it made Turkey dependent. Turkish military as a result of Turkish military presence, Turkish foreign policy is dependent on Russia in Syria. And it's, it's one of the biggest gains. And about your uh, question, uh, and it's a very important question, I think, uh, both for Caucasus and the Black Sea, which is quite very different than the Baltic Sea, there is no regional cooperation. Uh, between the countries in, in these regions. There is no uh, mutual interest, no, uh, eco no big economic integration. And uh, striking the, the, the biggest connecting line between these countries are Russian pipelines carrying Russian natural gas. As long as economic uh, integration uh, is uh, going to remain minimum, uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to, to talk about Black Sea region, a Caucasus region. Thank you so much. Uh, I have quickly. to answer that question regarding the relationship between Romania and Turkey. So from the very beginning, I would like to mention that we are not looking to regionalize the cooperation uh, because we have to take into consideration that Romania, Turkey and B uh, Bulgaria are NATO countries and we have to respect the NATO commitment and principles to look at the security, at the security 360 degrees. So um, the medium term and long term relationships should be under the provision of the NATO treaty uh, decisions and principles. Thank you very much. Thanks for clarifying that. Steve Flanagan, a no, final we'll, thoughts from your so side. So first, Bruno, yeah, no, well, to answer your question about stability, I think uh, General Tricka uh, touched very clearly and, and precisely on the key elements of, of, the, of the military deterrence, but also, and, and the military component of that, but also the 360 uh, uh, dimensions. Um, I, I think that one of the things that, uh, that is most and is, is implicit in the, in the question, the framing question for this conference is the whole question of maintaining cohesion uh, within the alliance. I mean, to me, that has been one of the paramount uh, goals of, of certainly U.S. policy uh, uh, since uh, 2014 and the response uh, to Russian aggression and, and the assault on elements of the existing European order was to, you know, take actions that could sustain the broadest possible consensus well, there might be some differences in, in, in implementation and, and emphasis, but nonetheless to maintain cohesion because that is really what the biggest threat was posed by both Russian aggression and other influence campaigns. So how do we maintain that? So this whole question of this conference of how do we look at a theme of, uh, of, of a set of issues that, uh, and initiatives that can be sustained across uh, the full spectrum and working closely not only with allies but with, with our partners uh, in the region. Um, so I would say, you know, this maintaining cohesion, uh, engaging, continue the engagement with partners and, and uh, the whole of government approach, uh, the uh, expansion of economic integration in the region, uh, that all of this, uh, all of this is part of the, the whole of, of being able to uh, project uh, stability, the whole notion of the initial justification of NATO enlargement, project the stability uh, that radiates from the, the core of Europe uh, to the broader region and, and maintain that, that hope and, and, and confidence in the future despite what is clearly obviously some of the uncertainties about the European integration process about certainly we can't sweep under the rug the, the doubts that were out there about the enduring U.S. commitment to aspects of the transatlantic relationship. I think I'm much more optimistic about the latter part. I do think that if you look at the continuity in, in what has been done uh, the last year and a half, uh, on the actual actions uh, of this administration, the current U.S. administration, uh, it's actually more reassuring about this enduring commitment. Um, so uh, let me stop on that. But then to answer the um, uh, professor's question about uh, about the uh, U.S. support for the PYDYPG, uh, I, I certainly understand uh, Turkish concerns about uh, the links between um, the YPG militias and the PKK. Uh, there's, uh, you know, in my mind, no doubt about uh, that, that those linkages and support. Uh, but the fact is that there, there were differences uh, at the beginning of the struggle against uh, against ISIL and ISIS, 
in, uh, in Syria about who was the most effective fighting force uh, the U.S. decided uh, based on the, the, the program and engagement with the Kurdish forces that, that they were the most effective and able to move forward. Uh, and so there was this, uh, this, uh, this relationship struck. Uh, that said, I think there have been serious efforts, uh, most recently uh, with Secretary Tillerson, one of his last missions as Secretary of State, going to Ankara, trying to develop an approach uh, that would uh, find some way forward, particularly beginning with Manbij uh, and suggesting that the uh, elements of ensuring that there was a, re a governance of, uh, that reflected the Arab populations as well as, as, well as the Kurds in terms of long-term control, clarifying what the U.S. was about in terms of this notion of training uh, forces for border security. Uh, it seemed to me that there were some elements there, and so I guess I would give Secretary Pompeo and his team some time to to work with the Turkish government and see how that could be resolved. Because I do think that both sides want to avoid, you know, the disaster that would take place if there were a confrontation, either over Manbij or other aspects of the policy in the region. And and my sense is that. Uh, that senior figures in the administration recognize this concern and, and are trying to find a way forward uh, without, uh, you know, without taking their eye off the, the main goal, uh, Anish, initial goal is to continue into the campaign to defeat uh, or at least uh, defeat this manifestation of, of ISIS and, and these other extremist groups. Thank you. Thank you very much. Clearly, we need a whole day to discuss uh, all the issues that we raised, uh, but I'm sure that uh, this discussion has demonstrated that uh, this conference is much needed. I'm sorry there was not more time to take your questions, but I do congratulate you and the panel for the issues that you did raise. Um, so, have a nice coffee break. <laughs> <laughs>